Hey everybody, today I'm in Winsboro, South Carolina, and it is home of the South Carolina Railroad Museum. So since we're in South Carolina, it's not all aboard, it is y'all aboard. So y'all can all come on aboard the train, y'all. You ready? Let's go. There are three locomotives lined up, and those are three of the five locomotives that we have. The one here on the front, number 2028, 20, uh, is a uh, EMD, electromotive diesel, SW, SW, I'll get it right yet, SW8. Uh, it and all the other locomotives date to the early 50s. Uh, this weighs about 100 tons, uh, about 800 horsepower. The engine that's sandwiched between the big wheels came to us from the U.S. Army at Fort Stewart. Uh, they were built, all of these were built in the early 50s. Uh, those two spent time in Korea. And one of the two had been shot by a North Korean uh, fire uh, during the war. It's been repaired before we got it, so there were no holes at the top. The uh, smaller boat are from uh, the U.S. Air Force. The U.S. Air Force had a little railroad over Shaw Air Force Base. Uh, they ran uh, six miles from CSX into the base and hauled jet fuel. And in the 1990s, late 1990s, uh, we'll be underway here in a moment once we get the riders up on the cab. So I'll start off by saying welcome to the Rockton, Ryan, and Western Railroad. We are the operating railroad of the South Carolina Railroad. I'm rather pleased about it. This railroad was built in 1883. I was in elementary school at the time and watched this cart truck, uh, ties being laid. Uh, and it was built for the sole purpose of carrying stone, Winsboro granite, from the quarry at Ryan. So the initial railroad was five miles long, ran from Ryan, which was a town, uh, up to here, which was originally called Robinson, but uh, after the railroad started coming, it became Rockton. And so the railroad was the Rock City Railroad, and it ran five miles, and it carried just stone, nothing else. No passengers, no farm machinery, except I lie a little bit because there was a short period of time in there where it loaded logs uh, at Greenbrier. You'll see what Greenbrier is as we go along. And uh, carried logs on up to interchange with the Charlotte, Columbia, and Augusta Railroad, the one that's out here right now, which is now Norfolk Southern. So it did carry some other stuff, but just barely. Nope. It'll be real pretty. Yeah, I like the bars. I think they're pretty cool. What's the coolest thing about bars? Hang on tight. that we have from what do you see back there? the Virginia Railway Express. That's a commuter line. It operates out of, uh, Chicago, out of the Chicago, Washington, down into southwestern Virginia. Those are bi-level cars. They hold about 80 people. Uh, and we can't use them in the summer. We use them in the winter now and then. But uh, we can't use them in the summer because they don't have air conditioning.
work you were doing. Alright. Fighting wow. stopped. That was scary. Now, when the train starts back up again, hold on. Yeah, hold on tight. <laughs>
found in the Greenbrier Cut. Greenbrier Cut was made by the railroad in the 1920s. The hill going up from Lion Road was a lot steeper than this. And by putting the cut in, they lengthened the hill. Still not even at the same height, but uh, you don't have to do it quite so hurriedly. And this is a good example of how rock is quarried. Notice the grooves down through the rock. They're really obvious on the uh, right side of the train because of the sunshine. Uh, you can see them on the left as well. And the way that you quarry granite is to drill down from the top with a star drill. Star drill is an iron rod with a kind of a cross on the end. You beat on it with a maul and just drill down through the rock, put dynamite or powder or TNT or whatever you have at the bottom, and blast the rock off the face. That's what you do in quarrying today, too. Except that, of course, instead of having to have a, a iron rod with a cross on the end of it and a maul to beat it down through, notice right here, there's one that went kind of through the rock.
here because this is as far as we're going to go. And I hope you've got enough money for the trip back. The uh, powder magazine was down here. Notice how far we are from the office building. You really don't keep your explosives close to the rest of your building because they can explode. That building is built with fairly strong outer walls, the granite blocks, and a very weak roof, so that most of the explosion force, if it did, would go straight up. Okay, now, we're going to trade sides here. We're down climbing the weeds and the
see how many cars we stopped. Yeah.
So now we're in the gallery, and this says the railroad dining experience. During the golden age of passenger rail travel, three major carriers served South Carolina. Seaboard Airline, Atlantic Coastline, and Southern Railway. Light railroads all across the country each offered a full-service dining car. Although railroad diners were money losers, they were considered a necessity by the carriers, who frequently sought to outdo the rivals by hiring noted chefs and offering cuisine unique to the particular region. And it says that each railroad had its own distinctive silver and china patterns, which were often borrowed from restaurant stock. Usually the carriers kept the patterns for several decades. And that's what this would be. So this says types of rolling stock. Trains have many different types of cars, also known as rolling stock. A train's function determines the type of rolling stock. Industrial railroads use freight cars to move resources and products. Passenger railroads use passenger cars to accommodate riders and their needs. So you got the freight, passenger, dining, and caboose. And this says working on the railroad, so now we can sing it loud and proud. I've been working on the railroad on a little long day. I've been working on the railroad just to pass the time away. Anyway, they've been singing that since 1894. So you got the conductors, the engineers, the brakemen, the onboard service employees, yard masters, train dispatchers, signalmen, maintenance workers, station agents, and switchmen. So it says on the left we have the yard limit sign and on the right we have the mile post marker and these down here these are the switches and this is a switch lantern here And that's the New York Central Locomotive Bell. And it said this bell belonged to the New York Central Mohawk Locomotive number 2565. And that right there is the Pennsylvania Railroad Locomotive Bell. So number 977. It's a sweet model train exhibit right there, if it was running. And this shows different depots here. It's the Hampton, Union Station, Winsboro, and Charleston. Mm -hmm. And it says this is a cast iron downspout. This downspout came from one of the buildings in the Charleston Railroad Depot complex. It's really pretty. And that is a railroad signal lot. Green used to indicate that clear or proceed yellow is to warn the engineer of an impending stop or speed reduction for an occupied block ahead. Also for use for low speed movements and red is used to indicate a full stop. So, you know, just like a regular red light. That's the South Carolina Railroad Achievements. In the history of American Railroad, South Carolina has always been an innovator and can claim several firsts in the national railroading timeline. And that's talking about the best friend of Charleston. We all know what happened to that one. <laughs> and this looks like an old office. Got all kind of stamps over there. Actually, it says it's the Branchville Depot. 
when the South Carolina Railroad extended its service to Columbia, the Branchville station became the first railroad junction or a station where two or more or more routes met. This photograph is of the Branchville Depot in 1960. Depot is another word for a station building. The room recreated here shows what the depot probably looked like in the 1920s or the 1930s. Very little had changed when the 1960 photograph was taken. So, so interesting. And that contraption right there that looks like a TV antenna is an order fork. It says paper messages or orders were placed on the pointed ends of order forks to pass information to moving trains. And this back here is the ticket box. It says Southern Railway Depot, Hickory Grove, South Carolina, circa 1900. And we can have a moment before there was computers, there was typewriters. <laughs> and you just had to click everything out on all those keys. Went bing, 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 bing. So I've actually used a typewriter in my life. I'm old enough to know what to do. I think mother is coming over now to put her wisdom in on it. What right, can you tell us about a typewriter? It's an underwood. That's on the back of it. I um, thought it was underwood before I even... Did you use one like that in your I, day? Yeah. It was some. You had it in typing class. Yes. Well, some, our typing teacher, she put, she would put you on the keys that did not have letters on it to start with. Yes, because as we all know, it's ASD. <laughs> ASDF JKL semicolon. They just pound that into your head whenever I was in school. Those are your home keys and everything else just comes to you. And that's all kind of railroad stuff there. This says train and track terminology. Track hardware to the right are the basic parts that make up a train track. Ties, rails, spikes, and tie plates. Maybe that's the lift. I don't know. Maybe that's what it is over there. Then you also have your gauges and your switches. And here's some more lanterns. Ooh, those are the whistles. And I love a train whistle. And this says railroad communication train order signals. How do trains avoid collisions? Trains rely on an order system to regulate track usage and avoid accidents. Before modern telephones and computer systems, dispatchers at train stations passed orders to train crews by telegraph and paper messages. And that, ooh, that's the locomotive headlight. So that's what you see beaming at you whenever it's coming down a train. Not when it's coming down the train, duh. When it's coming down the track. Yes. And this says Ryan and Anderson quarries. From skyscrapers to chicken feed, granite is a diverse stone. Operated by the Winsburg Granite Company. The Ryan Anderson quarries produced versatile, high-quality stone for nearly a century. And this right here was a railroad ticket cabinet. It says this cabinet was used to hold tickets in the depot. It is currently missing the ticket racks. And this cabinet was used by the Southern Railway Depot in Rock Hill, South Carolina. And there's a granite memorial. Company minute book, advertising items, postcard. 
No trespassing. Some granite blocks. And down there is some more miscellaneous stuff off of different trains. So it says this is the children's area. Stamp your own ticket. Each train depot has a special stamp. Use these stamps to make your own souvenir ticket from the Rockton, Ryan, and Western Railroad. So here was my ticket today. And I am not a child. But why not? And there we go. That's the stamp for here. So now we're gonna get on the train, the display train anyway. I believe that's trying to pull us too, because the rest of the train's attached to it, so it has to be. Alright, so here we go. There's another top rider. Yes. And it's got the name on the top of it. That is a roll. I've talked on some of them, too. And this says, watch your step. Huh? I said it says, watch your step. Well, I am. So this was the Seaboard Airline business car, the Norfolk. And it says the Norfolk was built in 1911 in Seaboard's Portsmouth. That's a weird sounding name. Virginia shops as a wood body steel under frame car in the late 1940s. It was modernized by adding steel sheathing. So now we shall mosey on down this narrow passageway. And this is a lovely bedroom. And a small bathroom. And this one was private, apparently. So then there would have been the shower. And that's what you call some tight quarters there. Here's another bedroom. This one looks larger to me. And it's got a toilet in there and some suits on the wall. I would just die a thousand deaths if somebody would be on that bed. Ooh, that would have scared me. I like the carpet down there. I don't know if that's from the 1940s as well. So this one was a bunk bed. Oh, it says, please look, but you do not enter into this, but you can enter it through here. So, that shows how little that is. And it's got outlets on the wall, toothbrush, soap, scissors, comb. Oh, bear. So this one was a bunk bed, so it would have had this strap right here to hold you in so you wouldn't fall off while the train was moving. And that little ladder to get up there. And obviously that's back from the days when there were people were thinner than what they are now. <laughs> so this is the dining area, it looks like. A really beautiful table setting. 
Oh, is it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll never use. Uh, well, you do dross us. It's a plus. You have a fancy chair you can sit down in. Some beautiful fake fruit up here. Fake flowers. Pretty china. Got a butter dish. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's a pretty egg. This is don't touch nothing. Well, you ain't gotta worry about me touching anything because I don't wanna have to pay for it. So this was, I guess, the kitchen. This is the mail car here. So this says mail car practice cards, South Carolina set. It says, by the early 1900s, railroads were critical to postal operations. Like Union Station in Washington, D.C., located adjacent to the city post office building, the post office department ordered that all new main post offices in large cities be built as near as possible to the principal railroad station. The railway post office service began in the midst of the Civil War and made a slow decline after World War II until the service's last run in 1977. And it says, the South Carolina Railway Museum's post office car was built in 1927 for the Southern Railway. The 60-foot car weighs 72 tons and was acquired by the museum in 1989. So this was show different places. You got like Warner Robins, Abbeville, Fort Valley, Fort Stewart, Covington, North Smyrna Beach, Franklin, Elgin, Air Force Base, Savannah, Livingston, Sweetwater, it's a Brett Maverick <laughs> reference there, um, South Pittsburgh, Irwin, Maryville, Victoria, Freeport, Bay City, Fayetteville, well, Fayette, Horton, Adamsville, This must have been the luggage compartment. There's some old luggage down there. And it says railroad stations of South Carolina, yesterday's bustle.
And that right there is a Southern Railway Fairbanks scale. So just in case you don't know what the best friend of Charleston is, this is the best friend of Charleston. This is the replica that's on display at the South Carolina State Museum in Columbia, South Carolina. You can go there and pay it a visit if you'd like to see it. So it says this is the Southern Railway baggage car. Baggage cars, also known as combine cars, if they are also featured a small section of coach seating for passengers. In these cases, the trains were normally low priority locals or secondary runs, became a fixture on passenger trains over the years as they almost always rode along directly behind the locomotive. So that's the information on that. There's an old book with old writing in it. It's like 1921 in that one. Wow. I think mom has gave up on me. She's already sitting down there. So we just got off the train there. It's like people's been writing on it. So this is the Southern Railway Pullman Bazette. This passenger car was built and originally owned by the Pullman Company, which operated its own fleet of sleeping cars under contract with many railroads. The railroads sold the tickets to ride and pull the cars, but the sleepers were actually operated and staffed by the Pullman Company. From the late 19th century to the mid-1940s, the Pullman Company was the primary operator of sleeping cars in the United States. It's a good thing they have steps down to get off of these things because I would never make it. I'm relatively tall and I'd have to throw my whole body into that thing just to get up there. And I'm still going to think they use this for livestock. It had to be for horses or cows or zebras or tigers or something. So this says the operation of a steam locomotive. Steam locomotives, while now a thing of the past, are technological and engineering marvels. Steam locomotives not only shaped America during its early days, they have been incredibly influential throughout modern day pop culture. So how do they work? So it's operated through the use of steam power and that right there shows you how it operates. And oh, isn't that a thing of beauty right there? So it says Hampton and Branchville, number 44. This is Hampton and Branchville, number 44. This locomotive was built in January of 1927 by the Baldwin Locomotive Works. She was built for the Hampton and Branchville Railroad, a short line railroad located at Hampton, South Carolina. The 44 spent its entire working career in South Carolina. It now rests here, retired at the South Carolina Railroad Museum and was taken out of service in 1959. After retirement, her boiler was used to hold fuel for the diesel locomotives that replaced her. So there is a look at her through all her history. And now she sits here for everybody that comes to the South Carolina Railroad Museum to enjoy. So 
So this says how the injector works. For some background, all locomotives were required to have two methods of inserting water into the boiler. One of which being the feed water heater and the other being the injectors. Both methods were required to be independent from each other for safety reasons. The injector is a unique piece of technology. Think of it like a can of spray paint. The steam forces the cold water into the boiler just as air forces paint out of a spray can paint. Spray paint can. One of these days, one of these days I'm gonna get it right. And this says how the steam chest works. The steam chest is one of the most important pieces of equipment on a steam locomotive. The steam chest is actually what distributes the steam into the cylinders and causes the locomotive to move. It is connected to the piston rod and valve stem, which actuate the steam valve. Notice how steam is both in front and behind the piston. The valve spool and the stem are what control the flow of exhaust and live steam through the cylinder. In simple terms, the steam chest is where steam moves the piston, which turns the wheels. And there it goes, number 44. So they do have a cute little photo area here. I don't know why we didn't utilize that. That says about a dining car. And about some passenger cars. and a nickel plate caboose. So, what did y'all think about the train ride since it was y'all aboard? Yeah, me. Glad we did it again? Yeah. Yeah, so if you haven't seen my video from last year, check out my South Carolina Railroad Museum video from last year. It's actually got better footage on it, I think, than what this year's does because I was on the front of the big green one. But I think that I was able to stand up better on the one we rode today. So today we rode the open air caboose. And last year we rode the open air green giant or whatever they call it. So how'd you enjoy it, Dad? Good. Good? And you enjoyed it? Mm -hmm. I enjoyed it as well. I think we had a great time, great weather. So, if you're ever in Winsboro, South Carolina, I have to highly suggest the South Carolina Railroad Museum. It's only open as far as train rides go, I think June, July, and August on every Saturday. And then they offer, I think, an Easter Bunny train, a pumpkin patch train, a Santa Claus train, and they also do barbecue trains. So, I guess they get the food on the board and take you on out so you can eat the barbecue. And the area that they take you for all that is down there where the Ringland Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus train cars are at. So, if you enjoyed this video, as always, thank you so much for watching. And subscribe. can you say it again for our louder? Subscribe. And what else? And hit the button. Hit the like button. Don't hit the dislike button. If you don't like it, just don't hit anything. But anyway, Thanks for watching. See you in the next video and bye. Oh yeah, and one more thing that I meant to add. The museum itself is open Wednesday through Saturday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. So you can visit and you can walk through the train like I walked through the train, but the train rides are on Saturdays. So I needed to clarify that before I end the video. So anyway, hope you enjoyed. Bye again.